from the introduction by Dr. Jung. Uh, okay, so today will be the last day of the introduction by Dr. Jung called Introduction to the Religious and Psychological Problems of Alchemy. And I'm reading uh, paragraph 39. And here he's, here Dr. Jung is introducing parts two and three of this book. Uh, these two parts, uh, if I show you this book, it's about an inch and a half thick. And uh, as you see, it's Psychology and Alchemy by C.G. Jung. And so these two parts are the guts of this book. And if you can imagine writing an essay that's half the thickness of this book, um, that's what you've got. You've got two essays that were presented at the Eranos conferences in 1936 and 1937 uh, at Ascona and in Italy. So, paragraph 39. Part two of this volume gives a large number of such examples. Okay, so he's talking about examples where dream images and historical mythology are the same, or images that came up in alchemy are the same as the images which came up in Nobel laureate Wolfgang Pauli's dreams. And so, um, let's see. So I'm going to go back into a little bit of paragraph 38. The history of religion in its widest sense, including, therefore, mythology, folklore, and primitive psychology, is a treasure house of archetypal forms from which the doctor can draw helpful parallels and enlightening comparisons for the purpose of calming and clarifying a consciousness that is all at sea. So what he means by this is that some patient has come to his clinic and they are, have been having terrifying dreams. They may involve dragons or whatever. And so he's uh, showing these people that these images have been coming up for thousands of years. It is absolutely necessary to supply these fantastic images that rise up so strange and threatening before the mind's eye with some kind of context so as to make them more intelligible. Experience has shown that the best way to do this is by means of comparative mythological material. Paragraph 39. Part two of this volume gives a large number of such examples. The reader will be particularly struck by the numerous connections between individual dream symbolism and medieval alchemy. This is not, as one might suppose, a prerogative of the case in question, but a general fact which only struck me some ten years ago when I first began to come to grips with the ideas and symbolism of alchemy. Paragraph 40. So, and it, it, before I go with paragraph 40, paragraph 39 then is just a brief intro into Wolfgang Pauli's uh, dreams. And apparently, uh, Dr. Jung and his colleague collected 1,000 dreams from uh, Wolfgang Pauli. And he's discussing about. Uh, he says about 400 of them in this book. It's not quite that many, but it's quite a number. Okay, so paragraph 40. Part 3 contains an introduction to the symbolism of alchemy in relation to Christianity and Gnosticism. As a bare introduction, it is naturally far from being a complete exposition of this complicated and obscure subject. Indeed, most of it is concerned only with Lapis-Christ parallel. Okay, the Lapis is 
the central part of alchemy, uh, which is lapis lazuli. True, this parallel gives rise to a comparison between the aims of the opus alchemicum and the central ideas of Christianity, for both are of the utmost importance in understanding and interpreting the images that appear in dreams and, is, and in assessing their psychological effect. This has considerable bearing on the practice of psychotherapy, because more often than not, it is precisely the more intelligent and cultured patients who, finding a return to the church impossible, come up against archetypal material and thus set the doctor problems which can no longer be mastered, which can no longer be mastered by a narrowly personalistic psychology. Nor is a mere knowledge of the psychic structure of a neurosis by any means sufficient. For once the process has reached the sphere of the collective unconscious, we are dealing with healthy material, i.e., with the universal basis of the individually varied psyche. Our understanding of these deeper layers of the psyche is helped not only by a knowledge of primitive psychology and mythology, but to an, but to an even greater extent by some familiarity with the history of our modern consciousness and the stages immediately preceding it. On the one hand, it is the child of the church, on the other of science, in whose beginnings very much lies hid the church, in whose beginnings very much lies hid that the church was unable to accept. That is to say, remnants of the classical spirit and the classical feeling for nature, which could not be exterminated and eventually found refuge in the natural his in the natural philosophy of the Middle Ages. As the Spiritus Metallorum and the astrological components of destiny, the old gods of the planets lasted out many a Christian century, whereas the Whereas in the church, the increasing differentiation of ritual and dogma alienated consciousness from its natural roots in the unconscious. Alchemy and astrology were ceaselessly engaged in preserving the bridge to nature, i.e. to the unconscious psyche from decay. <clears throat> astrology led the conscious mind back again and again to the knowledge of her Heimar mean, that is, the dependence of character and destiny on certain moments in time, and alchemy afforded numerous hooks for the projection of the for the projection of those archetypes which could not be fitted smoothly into the Christian process. It is true that alchemy always stood on the verge of heresy and that certain decrees leave no doubt as to the church's attitude towards it. But on the other hand, it was effectively protected by the obscurity of the symbolism. It was effectively protected by the obscurity of its symbolism, which could always be explained as harmless allegory. For many alchemists, the allegorical aspect undoubtedly occupied the foreground to such an extreme that they were firmly convinced that their sole concern was with chemical substances. But there were always a few for whom laboratory work was primarily a matter of symbols and their psychic effect. As the texts show, they were quite conscious of this to the point of condemning the naive gold makers as liars, frauds, and dupes their own standpoint they proclaimed with propositions like orum nostrum non est orum vulgi, uh, which I would roughly translate as our gold is not vulgar gold. Although their labors over the retort were a serious effort to elicit the secrets of chemical transformation, it was at the same time and often in overwhelming degree 
the reflection of a parallel psychic process, which could be projected all the more easily into the unknown chemistry of matter, since the process is an unconscious phenomenon of nature, just like the mysterious alteration of substances. What the symbolism of alchemy expresses is the whole problem of the evolution of personality described above, the so-called individuation process. So I just want to emphasize from this paragraph 40 that Dr. Jung was very concerned about how the church had separated humanity from our fundamental nature. And he was pointing out that it was the role of astrology and alchemy to try to keep human consciousness connected to our fundamental nature. And, but the church, by various dogma, was cutting us off, so we became kind of machines out there untethered instead of understanding our connection to the natural world. Paragraph 41. Whereas the church's great buttress is the imitation of Christ, the alchemist, without realizing it and certainly without wanting it, easily fell victim in the loneliness and obscure problems of his work to the promptings and unconscious assumptions of his own mind, since, unlike the Christians, he had no clear and unmistakable models on which to rely. The authors he studied provided him with symbols whose meaning he thought he understood in his own way, but in reality they touched and stimulated his unconscious. Ironical towards themselves, the alchemists coined the phrase obscurum per obscurius, but with this method of explaining the obscure by the more ex explaining the obscure by the more obscure, they only sank themselves deeper into the very process from which the church was struggling to redeem them. While the dogmas of the church offered analogies to the alchemical process, these analogies, in strict contrast to alchemy, have become detached from the world of nature through their connection with the historical figure of the Redeemer. The alchemical four in one, the philosophical gold, the lapis angularis, the aqua divina, became in the church the four-armed cross on which the only begotten had sacrificed himself once in history and at the same time for all eternity. The alchemists ran counter to the church in preferring to seek through knowledge rather than to find through faith though as medieval people they never thought of themselves as anything but good Christians. Paracelsus is a classic example in this respect, but in reality they were in much the same po but in reality they were in much the same position as modern man, who prefers immediate personal experience to belief in traditional ideas, or rather has it forced upon him. Dogma is not arbitrarily invented, nor is it a unique miracle, although it is often described as miraculous with the obvious intent of lifting it out of its natural context. The central ideas of Christianity are rooted in Gnostic philosophy, which in accordance with psychological laws simply had to grow up at a time when the classical religions had become obsolete. It was founded on the perception of symbols thrown up by the unconscious individuation process, which always sets in when the collective dominance of human life fall into decay. At such a time, at such a time, there is bound to be a considerable number of individuals who are possessed by archetypes of a numinous nature which force their way to the surface in order to form new dominance. This state of possession shows itself almost without exception in the fact that the possessed, ide 
in the fact that the possessed identify themselves with the archetypal contents of their unconscious and because they do not believe that the role which is being thrust upon them is the effect of new contents still to be understood, they, they exemplify these concretely in their own lives, thus becoming prophets or reformers. Insofar as the archetypal content of the Christian drama was able to give satisfying expressions to the uneasy and clamorous unconscious of the many, the consensus omnium raised this drama to a universally binding truth, not of course by an act of judgment, but by the irrational fact of possession, which is far more effective. Thus Jesus became the tutelary image or amulet against the archetypal powers that threatened to possess everyone. The glad tidings announced, quote, it has happened, but it will not happen to you inasmuch as you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, unquote. Yet it could, and it can, and it will happen to everyone in whom the Christian dominant has decayed. For this reason, there have always been people who, not satisfied with the dominance of conch, not satisfied with the dominance of conscious life, set forth, under cover or by devious paths, to their destruction or salvation, to seek direct experience of the eternal roots, and following the lure of the restless unconscious psyche, find themselves in the wilderness where, like Jesus, they come up against the son of darkness. Thus an old alchemist, and he a cleric, prays, Purge the horrible darknesses of our mind, light a light for our senses. The author of this sentence must have been undergoing the experience of the negredo, the first stage of the work, which was felt as melancholia in alchemy and corresponds to the encounter with the shadow in psychology. <clears throat> Paragraph 42. When, therefore, modern psychotherapy once more meets with the activated archetypes of the collective unconscious, it is merely the repetition of a phenomenon that has often been observed in moments of great religious crisis, although it can also occur in individuals for whom the ruling ideas have lost their meaning. An example of this is the dissensus ad inferos depicted in Faust, which consciously or unconsciously is an, opum, is an opus alchemicum. Paragraph 43. The problem of opposites called up by the shadow plays a great, indeed the decisive role in alchemy, since it leads in the ultimate phase of the work to the union of opposites in the archetypal form of the Heros Gamos, or chemical wedding. Here the supreme opposites, male and female, as in the Chinese, yang and yin, are melted into a unity purified of all opposition and therefore incorruptible. The prerequisite for this, of course, is that the artist should not identify himself with the figures in the work, but should leave them in their objective, impersonal state. So long as the alchemist was working in his laboratory, he was in a favorable position, psychologically speaking, for he had no opportunity to identify himself with the archetypes as they appeared, since they were all projected immediately into the chemical substances. The disadvantage of this situation was that the alchemist was forced to represent the incorruptible substance as a chemical product, an impossible undertaking which led to the downfall of alchemy, its place in the laboratory being taken by chemistry. But the psychic part of the work did not disappear. 
it captured new interpreters, as we can see from the example of Faust and also from the signal connection between our modern psychology of the unconscious and alchemical symbolism. So what Dr. Jung was basically saying here is that the alchemists were early chemists. Yes, they were, and they were in many cases employed by the leaders of medieval Europe to develop useful chem uh, chemicals for the leaders, whether they be for uh, medicines or for uh, weapons of war, um, poisons, let's say. Um, so these alchemists as chemists were useful to the leaders of the Western world for that. Um, but what they may or may not have known is that they were also um, investigating the objective psyche. And so when they are talking about searching for gold, um, they are not talking about physical gold, not, um, I think the chemical name is AU, not gold like you would make a bracelet of, but the gold of the most deep layer of the psyche, uh, which is the lapis and is symbolized by uh, Christ himself, as Dr. Ewing explains in chapter five of Ion, researches into the phenomenology of the self. Uh, so I'll take a look at your comments and please feel free to ask questions or make comments now. <clears throat> now I've uh, finished the reading per se, but I will uh, refer back here. Martin says, the collective unconscious is the great dragon, but I read that it is all that it also develops into the great mother, but also read the wise old man. My question is, is the male and female archetype related to us like the anima and animus and contrasexual? Um, okay, that's uh, several questions, so I, I'll have to um, unpack it a little bit. Um, <clears throat> so the collective unconscious is the great dragon. Well, let's think of um, mm -hmm. the collective unconscious as the group source of psychic energy. So it's the group source of the energies which drive the, um, the mass man. And the unconscious self in the individual is the source of psychic energy within the individual. So that's step one. Um, and it can develop into the great mother. Uh, yes, it can, because um, the great mother would be symbolic of something that is creative, that's creating something new. And, um, and so even something like World Wars One and Two could be seen as the great mother, first of all, destructive, but then offering a creative change to the world, let's say, on a collective basis, uh, because, um, you know, before World War II, uh, Japanese civilians who barely had access to little radios uh, thought Westerners had tails. I mean, literally, that, that was their level of knowledge at that point. And, um, and, you know, they must have had broadcasters who uh, were just as bad as our worst examples of cable television uh, news people today or um, political pundits and who call people by names and that sort of things. But people were much less sophisticated a hundred years ago. So mm -hmm. when they would say, you know, Westerners have tails, uh, you know, they would actually imagine that. Today, it would be a lot harder to get that same idea to sell around the world. 
Um, and but anyway, when there's destruction, then something new emerges and um, new life emerges from a mother or a great mother in the case of uh, something collective. So if we take uh, Japan as an example, uh, most Japanese people were fairly backward before World War II, um, but after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, then they had to uh, reinvent themselves. And so uh, I had the experience in the 1980s of going to um, a bar in Nagoya. We often went to this bar and the symbol of the bar, uh, which were, was on all of their coasters, which was actually the symbol of the U.S. Marine Corps, <laughs> which, which always gave me a giggle. But the reason that it was that symbol is because the women who operated that bar felt that the Marines had brought them back to life after the war and, and given them so much. And I, as most of you know, probably I lived in Japan for eight years, three years in high school and three years in the early 1980s when I ran a company there. And when I ran a company there, I mean, it, no, I'm sorry, it was five years when I was running a company uh, from 1980 through all the way through 84. And during that time, I had many occasions to go to Hiroshima. And I recall that when I first went there, my first trip, I was quite apprehensive because I didn't really know how Americans would be received in Hiroshima. And I remember getting off the train at Hiroshima Station and looking and seeing a Japanese Zero complete with the meatball on the side of the airplane as a, as a model, like we might have a uh, here in Annapolis, we have the Naval Academy, so we we have actual old F-18s <laughs> that are that are up on stands, and well, they had they had a Japanese Zero uh, because they had built the Japanese Zero uh, there in Hiroshima, and um, so I get off the train, and that's the very first thing that I saw, and I said, "Oh my God, this is going to be terrible," but. What I found was that the people of Hiroshima were the most welcoming and the friendliest Japanese of all Japanese I ever met in now over 50 years of going back and forth to Japan um, and eight years of actually physically living there. Um, of all those Japanese that I've met, uh, the people of Hiroshima are the most welcoming. and. The only, the only thing they ask is whether we have visited um, their peace museum. And of course, that's a mu museum that depicts the atom bomb being dropped on Hiroshima. And it's a very moving experience, as you can well imagine. Uh, but the Japanese are very good about um, wanting you to understand what they went through. But I had the, um, I had the experience that um, they must have been so friendly because immediately after uh, the dropping of the atom bomb, there were American occupation forces and aid workers in there in very short order. And everything that pe the people of Hiroshima had in the er by the early 1980s, so 35 years after the bomb, um, basically everything that they had then had its origins from the help that Americans gave the people of Hiroshima after uh, World War II. Um, and 
I think the people of Nagasaki were uh, a little bit left out on that. I never did go to Nagasaki, so I can't say, but my wife who did go uh, said that you know, they felt like they had been left behind because Hiroshima had so much help, but Nagasaki did not. Um, but, uh, and anyway, I, I remember being extremely embarrassed uh, one evening in a hotel in Hiroshima when the mayor of Portland, Oregon, was present in the bar and he had become um, drunk and boisterous and he was being extremely offensive to the Japanese and was making a lot of comments about World War II, which at that point was 35 years in the past. And um, I finally had to go up to him and straighten him out because uh, it, it was just so embarrassing to me what the things that he was saying. And they really had nothing to do with the people of Hiroshima at that time in the early 1980s. And uh, he was just making a fool of himself. So anyway, that's my experience uh, with that. So uh, let's see. So anyway, we, we got through the great mother. So that great mother was a very difficult one. And uh, uh, yeah, you can read the wise old man also. Um, and... Um, I was reading this morning, um, I was reading this morning Herman Hesse's uh, novel, Siddhartha, which I read um, years and years ago, back uh, before I went to my freshman year of college, and I could not remember it, so I decided I would go back and read it on audio, and there is an excellent version of it on audible.com. I highly recommend it to you. Um, but in there, there's a comment about uh, wisdom not being um, everything that it's cracked up to be. <laughs> so um, one has to get, excuse me, one can't get wisdom by seeking out a wise man or a wise woman. One can only get wisdom by having the direct experience oneself. And this was uh, Dr. Jung's point also, which is that um, rather than having belief, um, you, you really need to know something and he always preferred to know something and you can only know something if you have the experience uh, and that's the point and uh, of course and so in terms of religion uh, Dr. Jung would always favor the religious experience but the the church fathers um, stamped out that kind of religion, which was viewed as quote-unquote Gnostic, um, because they wanted to interpose themselves be between God and the faithful, because if they did that, then they would have a source of income. Uh, let's see, then he said, is the male and female archetype related to us like the anima and animus and contrasexual? Um, You know, I really don't care for um, the idea of male and female archetype per se, and I rather object to it being attached to Logos and Eros. And uh, today, uh, one of our subscribers brought to my attention a letter that Dr. Jung had written about Albert Einstein, and in that letter, uh, Dr. Jung 
said that he thought Einstein probably didn't understand him very well at all because um, he said that Einstein was totally on the quantitative side and that he was totally on the qualitative side. And so that's sort of a similar dichotomy. These dichotomies of yin and yang come up everywhere. And what you attribute to one or the other, um, you know, is, is uh, not necessarily appropriate to make it make it seem like the dark side is always feminine and the light side is always masculine. Yeah, you know what? <laughs> Who says, right? And uh, I, was, I was just, uh, um, if I can find this text message, maybe not. I was looking at one this morning. Um, anyway. Uh, let me go on, um, but you know, okay, so there are uh, male archetype style uh, um, governments, let's say, um, and uh, we have a president who's trying to uh, commit us to, you know, the ultimate logos uh, government right now, and I don't know that we should really appreciate that um, because there's two sides, and so um, uh, I have a friend who's a, a subscriber here who I follow. Uh, she happens to be a uh, sex therapist, um, and um, she I read her. Um, her Twitter feed very often, and um, she retweeted a, a tweet this morning that was from a Dr. Stephen Snyder, MD, and the question he raises is, are male and female erotic minds really so different? And he says, yes, at the extremes, but many of us seem to be mashups of the two. And so I guess that's the uh, that's the point to be made about this um, masculine and feminine that society and us are all mashups of both masculine and feminine. So I'm not in favor of trying to clearly delineate between the two sides. Um, let's see. Uh, And um, Martin also asks about whether it's contrasexual. Well, certainly I would say that um, if we think of a kinder and gentler society, uh, someone might think of that as a feminine way of thinking about the world. Uh, and so to the extent that we have uh, a government that's trying to be extremely hyper masculine, although it's led by um, someone who uh, was in a medical appointment for bone spurs the day that they taught about Gen Genghis Khan um, drilling holes in the Great Wall of China. Uh, Nonetheless, our president wants to have a very masculine, powerful, I would be the greatest general ever type of guy. Uh, I would, my guess is that he might not survive very long in combat. Um, but uh, nonetheless, he, he wants to believe that he is the wonderful one. And it's obvious that he's been uh, overwhelmed by the God image in, in himself. He's been overwhelmed by the self, so he really has no ego that can differentiate between right and wrong. We see this every day on uh, cable news, unfortunately. Um, and uh, 
And so, but when you have a, that kind of a go government, then the natural contrasexual, if you want, Martin, if you want to talk about contrasexual in the mass, mass of humanity or the mass of Americans, uh, the, the contrasexual would be a, a kinder, gentler society. Um, and um, as we had it in when President Obama was elected, he was selling hope and the GOP was selling fear. Um, and so, and that's the standard thing that's being uh, sold. Uh, there was an interesting tweet the other day that uh, sort of puts this in very clear terms. If I can find it quickly, I will. Um, okay, so this is right wing. Okay, so this is uh, a short history of the American right. And so it's OMG, OMG, many things. So I'll just read them off quickly. A short history of the American right. Oh my God, Indians. And then Oh my God, vengeful slaves. And then, oh my God, Catholics. And then, oh my God, Jews. And then, oh my God, Japanese. And then, oh my God, Russians. Then, oh my God, communist sympathizers. And then, oh my God, Negroes. Oh my God, women libers. Oh my God, lesbians. Oh my God, AIDS. Oh my God, welfare queens. Oh my God, weapons of mass destruction. Oh my God, gay marriage. Oh my God, Ebola. Oh my God, Mexicans. Oh my God, refugees. And so it's very clear that the American political right, and we all remember all these things, or those of us who are of an age, um, remember all these things and so it's very clear that the American right wants to sell fear uh, and the left wants to sell hope or a kinder and gentler society if you will. Thomas says reading John Hersey's Hiroshima around age 1718 was in fact the beginning of my political awakening. I wrote an essay on Kent State shortly after that as a direct result of reading Hersey. Um, I, uh, I'm sure it would be interesting. Um, I remember Kent State very clearly. I was in um, I was in interrogation officer school in the Marine Corps, pending going to Vietnam as an interrogation officer when Kent State occurred. Uh, Thomas says, more recently, and with access to a lot of papers that were not available to Hersey, Gail Alperovitz, the decision to use the atomic bomb, has made me rethink the event that kept my dad out of World War II. My dad turned 18 just a few weeks before Hiroshima and thus avoided any dangerous military service facilitating possibly my birth in 53. Um, And um, so uh, what I would say is that I've had many Japanese say to me that they're, they're thankful that the atomic bomb was used, although it was obviously um, a terrible thing. But if there hadn't been an atomic bomb, uh, it was likely that there would have been a a million deaths instead of a hundred thousand deaths because the U.S. armed forces were, were preparing for an invasion of the mainland of Japan and there were really no soldiers there anymore because many of the soldiers, many of the Japanese soldiers had been killed by that time through the Battle of Okinawa and so they were literally changed training 15-year-old girls to um, be on the beaches with bamboo spears to defend the homeland against an American invasion. 
And so you can just imagine how horrific that would have been as compared to Hiroshima. You know, they're both terrible, quite obviously, but uh, <clears throat> most of the Japanese I've ever known uh, have told me that they believed that given the circumstances of World War II, and most Japanese are well apprised of it, mm -hmm. um, it was a good thing that it, it happened because it put the war to an end immediately. And, uh, and so it's very hard to understand and appreciate these things unless you've um, been a part of these cultures um, for many years. And, you know, I, you know, I just have tremendous respect for the Japanese people uh, now and how they came out of World War II. And of course, when I was there the first time, it was only, <clears throat> Well, I arrived 16 and a half years after the war. And so at that time, the Cathedral of Yokohama, for example, uh, was still in ruin. And the building in which I went to high school had been the old, only building left standing at the end of World War II in Yokohama. Uh, and the reason it was left standing was that it was a stucco building and it was had been a hospital. And so it had a red cross on it and the Americans didn't bomb it. But every other building in Yokohama had been destroyed either by firebombing or something. So it was truly horrific. Um, <clears throat> and uh, So uh, also, uh, Thomas, in terms of uh, facilitating your birth, um, you know, I, I always had a very negative attitude about my paternal grandfather, um, but my paternal grandfather had been basically psychologically destroy, destroyed by um, the Great Depression and uh, the crash of 29. And he got through that time and, um, you know, was the father of my father uh, and my father's two sisters um, and somehow managed to support them. And so by the time I came along, he was fairly well recovered from those times, but he was an alcoholic and actually died from alcohol alcoholism uh, at uh, the age of 68. But and so I always thought of him as Willie Loman, but there's one thing that he did. Um, and for those of you who don't know, it's uh, Willie Loman was the character <clears throat> in Eugene O'Neill's play, Death of a Salesman. Um, and he had been a traveling salesman and an alcoholic, but years earlier in the late 30s, he had uh, very specifically gone around and tried to figure out how to keep his son alive because he knew that uh, World War II was coming. And so he learned from a congressman who couldn't give him a political appointment because political appointments go to sons of political supporters, presumably. And by that appointment, I mean into the U.S. Naval Academy. But the congressman told him how to get my father into the academy, and that was by um, going, to, uh, going into a program that had the student join the Navy Reserve and go to one year of another college and then go to the Naval Academy. Uh, and so my father joined the Navy in 1940. And it so happened that he was on the first American ship to sink a U-boat in World War II, even before 
uh, Pearl Harbor, but he actually entered the Naval Academy in the summer of 1942 and graduated in 1945. So he spent the entire war essentially in the Naval Academy after that one action. And so that's why I got to be here. And so I, once I worked all that out, <clears throat> I had much more respect for my uh, grandfather who um, encountered severe difficulties in his lifetime. Opiami cooking shows, entertainment are on the rise now as they were before the fall of Rome. <laughs> yeah, people don't want to know. <laughs> I'm sure that's true. Uh, Thomas says, Russia's influence on the decision weighs heavily in the latter book. No doubt the Japanese plan to fight to the last person, as did Germany. I was quite surprised at what the author uncovered. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of stuff there, and a lot of it I've read and then put in my deep unconscious and tried to forget uh, because it was a, a very sad time. And, you know, many of the people that I knew uh, during my time uh, actively at working in Japan uh, suffered greatly. Um, and uh, I had a, I call her, or I have um, a Japanese sister who, I call her that because um, when, when I was in high school, uh, her mother was teaching English at the American Navy base and she persuaded my mother and father to sponsor her daughter to come to the United States to go to college. And um, she um, she was two years older than me, so she came to the U.S and stayed with my grandmother for a year and went to a second senior year of high school, which in timing wise made her a freshman in college the same year I was. So all through our college education, um, she was always spending uh, holidays and so on with my grandparents as I was because my uh, parents were still in Japan, especially in the early days. and. Um, and her mother and father had uh, amazing experiences. They were very, um, you know, high upper class Japanese. They had met in Boston in the 1930s and her father had gone to Harvard and um, her mother had gone to uh, I don't know if it's Massachusetts Conservatory of Music or Boston Conservatory of Music. I don't remember now. But anyway, the, these two Japanese people um, met in Boston and they were in the United States when Pearl Harbor took place and they were on the last ship that was allowed to leave uh, the U.S. West Coast and go back to Japan after Pearl Harbor. And um, they lost a child uh, in Tokyo to disease. Um, and then my counterpart um, and her sister and brother were in the, um, went to the mountains as the, as the Londoners did. Uh, and it turned out that her father and I, um, I didn't know this when I was in high school, but I, when I went back 16 years later, he was kind enough to talk to me. And he was an incredible man. His, he was uh, the same age as Emperor Hirohito. So this is the current emperor's father and the one that was in power during World War II. And he had been in the diplomatic corps and during World War II, 
he was the consul general of Japan in Shanghai, believe it or not. And so talking to him across the table was like being able to touch history. And um, after the war, he was assigned as the defense counsel to uh, defend one of the eight Japanese war criminals. He wasn't a lawyer, but he was assigned to the task of being the defense counsel in the war crimes trial. And uh, he did that for three years, and then his client was hanged. Um, and he went on in the Foreign Service, and when I knew him then in the 80s, he was the editor-in-chief of Sekai Nippo, which was, um, it means world news, but it's it, the equivalent of um, the, the Hill newspaper today, okay, the newspaper of the U.S. Congress. Well, he was the... Um, editor of Sekai Nippo, and so among other things, his task in his late 80s was to get up at four o'clock in the morning, let's say, and uh, listen to uh, a speech by Ronald Reagan, and then write an editorial about it for th this newspaper. So uh, I've definitely had some experiences with, with some very interesting people. Um, let's see. Opiami. And Opiami says, was I ever drunk? Uh, I most certainly was drunk. Um, and um, on the worst occasion, which was when I was a freshman in college, uh, I had come back from Japan and was staying with my grandparents, and I'd gone to this men's college, and at, at Thanksgiving time, um, I had um, gotten a ride from upstate New York down to Washington for Thanksgiving holiday, and on November 25th, 1964, um, I was in an auto accident. I, fortunately, I was not driving, but there were five of us in a car on a very rainy night, and um, the car skidded out of control, and um, the boy that was two seats to my right uh, had his neck broken and was killed, and the boy next to me um, had his collarbone broken in two places and his pelvis broken in two places. And at the end of that accident, I was the only one awake, uh, or still conscious, and I could still walk. I had, fortunately, I'd pulled my knees up to my face and broken my jaw. Um, but only a hairline fracture. It was quite painful, but it wasn't debilitating. And so that was a very difficult weekend for an 18-year-old boy uh, because I had to be the one who identified the, the body of my friend. And um, I went back to college, and the following... Um, Saturday, I was cooking steaks on the loading dock of our uh, commons, and I put my hand uh, into the door, and the door slammed shut from the wind and caught my finger, so I still have the scar from, uh, from that day, which is now quite a while ago, 54 years ago. And... Um, so I was in tough shape psychologically, and I was in both physical and psychological pain. And so when the Christmas holiday came around three weeks later, um, 
my roommate and I bought a fifth of Johnny Walker Red Label. And the two of us drank this fifth without mixer uh, in about half an hour. Okay, so in 30 minutes, the two of us consumed um, a fifth of Johnny Walker, a fifth of a gallon of Johnny, Johnny Walker. And um, I probably nearly killed myself on that occasion. I know it took me two weeks to get over the hangover, uh, but that was the worst case. Um, and, uh, but I've never been tempted in the, in the way that alcoholics are tempted toward anything, really. Uh, I've never been a smoker, although my father was a serious smoker, two-pack-a-day guy for 60 years. Thomas says, there's also Brian Victoria's Zen at War concerning the Zen complicity in the military in Japan in the 30s and 40s. Horrific reading as well. I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is. Um, you know, I, once you get mass thinking going, people lose their minds. And, um, you know, this is one of the things which... Dr. Young was always very concerned about, obviously, was how um, how to keep us uh, from becoming mass men. And, um, you know, as as we look around, I, I, you know, I now see it everywhere. So, as I mentioned a couple of days ago, I was watching the Rose Parade and I was watching all these marching bands and how you know, we're all taught, taught to be uh, mass men, to do things as, or mass men and women, uh, to do things in unison and so on. And, and that's how we, we are controlled um, and manipulated by our politicians. And so we're taught that from a very early age. We're taught regimentation. Um, you know, it's, it, it's, oh, it's a great thing because it's a marching band, but when you're in a marching band, you're learning to be a mass man. And obviously, in my experience in the Marine Corps, too, you know, in the Marine Corps, you're, you're a weapon, a kind of weapon. And the, the mass of the Marines, as I've pointed out in a video a, couple, a few weeks ago, uh, you can see in that video how Marines become, um, you know, behave as one. And, um, and so in the Marine Corps, there's no doubt if you're given an order, you will follow it. You will follow your order no matter what it is and no matter what the danger. And, um, and you do that because you're trained to do that. But, um, but in order to have uh, a balanced society, we need individuals who can step back from that mass thinking and understand uh, what's been done to us. And, um, and so anyway, uh, so Okami says, you're clearly not a lush. No, I'm not a lush. <laughs> I'm glad I survived that incident in 1964. Uh, Thomas says, I've been abstaining from all inebriates for the past eight months, and as I watch programs on Netflix and Amazon, or almost anywhere, I'm amazed at the drinking I see. Yeah, there's a lot of it, and you know, it's not only drinking, but it's also opioids and so on. And last year, just with the opioid epidemic, we killed 72,000 people in the United States. And keep in mind that the whole Vietnam War, we lost 58,000 in, in the whole 15 years of the Vietnam War. So uh, this epidemic that we currently have in intoxicants is totally frightening. Um, it says in cop shows, uh, and in religiously themed shows, it's everywhere in our society, absolutely. Um, and, you know, obviously when we go around staring at these things, 
um, these are constantly grooming us to be mass people and to think that, um, you know, think that certain things are important. And um, I think it's, um, I think it'd be very good for anybody that's watching this now uh, to read uh, Siddhartha, which is uh, Herman Hesse's novel. Um, I'm currently, I'm 20 minutes from the end of it right now on my second go through. And it's a very, very interesting and powerful um, book, but it's, uh, it's, definitely about how one individuates and becomes an individual human being. Um, and that was what Dr. Jung's entire work was about. Um, and Thomas says it normalizes drinking. A little research, 480,000 died from tobacco in the U.S., 88,000 from alcohol and 70,000 from overdoses, no deaths from marijuana, however. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. So 480,000 from tobacco, oh my God. Um, and um, Thomas says, our phones inhibit conversation, don't you think? Um, you know, yes and no, I, you know, all things in, moderation, including moderation. Um, I, um, if, if I look at communications devices that I've had access to in my career, I realized that, you know, I was one of the very early adopters in email networks. And my wife and I believe that we may be the first couple in the world to meet online and marry. And if not the first, we're certainly in the first five couples that met online and married because we met on August 22nd, 1985 and the World Wide Web, and we met online, okay? And the World Wide Web didn't even get started as a commercial enterprise for another decade after that. This was just on rudimentary email networks. But in four months of exchanging emails back and forth, so that was a conversation, I knew my current wife better than I knew my wife of 17 years, my first wife of 17 years. I had been married work for 17 years and even though we had a, a moderately good marriage by most accounts and though we still love and respect one another which is very rare among couples that break up um, I was just with her on Thanksgiving uh, at one of my daughter's houses um, but we never had anything like the relationship that I currently have with my wife. And, um, and you know, I wouldn't even venture to describe it, but I, I can say uh, quite emphatically that I knew her better in four months than I knew my first wife in 17 years. And after four months, I moved out and moved in with my second wife on the same day. And so, um, uh, so I think that, you know, if, if you're using this to converse with someone, uh, and communicate, you know, then, okay. Um, you know, it, I guess it depends on your personality. I mean, I, if you're a introvert as I am, it probably means you don't like to go to bars very much, or you wouldn't want to go and meet somebody in a bar, heaven forbid, but extroverts would like to do that. And so I think it depends on personality. Um, and, um, and so, you know, everything in moderation, as I say. Um, and yeah, I, I agree, Thomas, that texts are conversations. And so I'm 
he's with me on this point. Okay, Martin says there is a YouTube audiobook up, Siddhartha full audiobook by Herman Hesse, and uh, terrific. Uh, if you can get that, get it, get it there, get it there. I I haven't listened to that one, so I can't speak to the. Uh, to the uh, reader, but the reader on audible.com is also very good. It never occurred to me to check on YouTube to see if there was a reading. Uh, Thomas says, all technologies have their double edges, I suppose. And, and you know, this is kind of the, the, um, the punchline of Siddhartha, which is, um, and it's sort of the punchline of of, uh, of uh, Dr. Young too, which is if you have a duality, if there's if there's wisdom, then there's also the flip side, which is non-wisdom, sense and nonsense. And so all of these things have their dual side, and so it's therefore important to try to achieve a conjunctio and hold both in your consciousness at the same time. Um, and uh, Thomas says, certainly communication with faraway friends is helped by these phones. It once costs money to talk long distance. Lots of money, absolutely. I mean, when I was in Japan running a company, uh, it was costing the company $2,000 a month just for my communication costs nowadays, um, you know, I very often have conversations with people on the other side of the world and their video conferences and, um, and they don't cost anything or they cost very little. Um, and, uh, in our advanced reading group, we have, um, we have several members who are in Europe and, you know, they participate in our seminar for two hours on video conference, which, you know, when I was doing that 25 years ago, that would cost you know, thousands of dollars to, to do that. And now we can just do it freely. It's, it's amazing. Uh, Torsa, Tor is from Norway, I believe. Uh, and uh, he says, agree with both Thomas and Dennis. Uh, the legal drugs and heroin is the deadliest. Yep. Uh, and Opiami says, uh, well, bless you. Um, and Thomas says, I read Siddhartha thinking it was Hesse's biography of Buddha but it's not quite that, has uh, tweaks the tail, yes. And uh, I, I wanted to go back and read it f because I thought maybe that had been the case and I had just forgotten over the years. Uh, but uh, he is not the Buddha. Uh, he does meet Gautama um, during his experience uh, of growing growing up and, and maturing and individuating, which is essentially what he was doing. Um, but it's very interesting uh, what Hesse does with this book. And as I said, in this book, uh, C.G. Jung, a biography and books, it mentions that Jung f or many Jung followers think that these books, D Damien and Siddhartha and Steppenwolf are excellent um, entries into Jungian psychology. And since I've read uh, uh, Damien and Siddhartha both in the last two weeks, I can say that I agree with that. Um, and so if you're having trouble with Jungian psychology, that would be a way to get into it in an easy way. Thomas says, Journey to the East is another Hess's work that I highly recommend a very short book, but pithy. Reread it, reread it recently, so much more than my early reading. Uh, yeah, I think um, education is wasted on the young. 
<laughs> you know, I um, when I think about it, um, there's almost nothing that I remember uh, from my college days or my law school or um, or my business school. And the I learned three things in business school. And none of them were in the classroom because the classroom was all about statistics. And I struggled through that stuff. But, um, but the lessons I learned, um, one was from uh, a student who was one year ahead of me. And he had been a, a Marine first lieutenant when I was a second lieutenant. And he had been my primary gunnery uh, instructor at Fort Sill. And so I so happened that I ran into him uh, in this business program. And he um, by then was a major and I was also a major at that point. And so I had lunch with him to talk about the program and decide whether I was going to go to this business school. And I said, you know, Jack, why are, why are you doing this? And he says, so that now nobody can bullshit me. <laughs> and, you know, that was a pretty good piece of advice because, um, you know, once I had gone to that business school, which was 15 courses in statistics by different names, I knew what the flaws of statistics were. Uh, so that was one thing I learned. And um, the second thing I learned, I had a essay required in microeconomics. And um, by then I had been practicing law for several years and I was myself teaching business law at another college as an adjunct. And so I was, thought I was pretty smart and I got my first essay homework assignment back and I had a D and I couldn't understand it. And so my professor uh, pulled me aside and explained to me uh, the cost benefits analysis, but he taught me that outside the classroom. I never got it in the classroom, but I did okay after that. And um, then the third thing I learned was we had a terrifically difficult finance exam, which again was a statistics exam. And uh, one of my classmates was uh, then a 45-year-old um, New York telephone executive. Uh, and so for, for the rest of us, I mean, I was 30 at the time. And so for me, he was an older guy. And uh, he came out of that finance to exam and he was spitting nails. He was so angry. And the professor, uh, who's still up there, believe it or not, his name is Cliff Smith. Um, Cliff uh, was about 30 then also. And uh, he, was, he was just getting chewed up one side and down the other by this New York tell executive. And um, when, when he finally slowed down, he, uh, Cliff's response, and he was uh, from Atlanta, so he had a fairly thick um, southern accent at that time. Uh, Cliff says, hey, man, if it wasn't tough, it wouldn't be worth anything. <laughs> and so that was a good lesson. Uh, that was a good lesson. Uh, but none of the things that I learned in the classwork classroom or have been any use at all. And, uh, you know, I studied all these, um, you know, statistical things, which would have been very good if I ever worked for the census, maybe, but you never, in most businesses, you never have a big enough population to make the statistics that they teach you uh, be worth anything. Um, and so... Tom says, I wonder if you ever read the works of Suzuki. He wrote on Zen and was translated into English. And yes, I have. And also, um, it was his book that uh, on Zen that uh, 
Dr. Young wrote a foreword to, I think, in about 1937. It appears in, uh, I believe, volume 11 of the collected works. You could probably find it there. And for those of you who are listening who don't know, uh, we have a Dropbox uh, for the group. And uh, if you write to me at skip.conover at gmail.com, I will add you to the Dropbox. I have one person who I owe an addition to, which I'm going to do uh, later today. Um, but if anybody else uh, wants to be in the Dropbox, you can find a lot of treasures there, which I don't, what, what I, what is there I don't talk about on video. Uh, but anyway, uh, if you look, you will find the treasure. Um, Miles says, FYI, I shared your channel with two guys who have a chat called Head in the Box. Would be interesting in being a guest, would be interested in being a guest on their channel. If you're asking me, I'd say, sure, why not? Um, by the way, congratulations on 3,000 subscribers. Thanks. Yep. Hey, we hit the magic number a couple of days back. Uh, and uh, and that's up about that's up 2000 from February. So um, things are progressing. Um, one shouldn't think that this is a highly profitable activity, though. It's still uh, worth about 80 cents a day or something like that. But <laughs> it might be a dollar a day by now. But uh, I, I don't want to give anyone the sense that by growing a, a large following on YouTube, you're going to become uh, very successful financially from YouTube. Um, at least not from the ad, from advertising, from YouTube payments. Uh, Thomas says the Dropbox contents are quite useful, especially the following along with readings. Yeah, I, I think it would be uh, quite useful and um, so anyway um, I have now completed the introduction to the religious and psychological problems of alchemy uh, which is from this book psychology and alchemy by CG Jung and um, and so I haven't really gotten into the meat of it. I'm, I'm going to consider whether I'm going to go into all these dreams of Pauli or not in terms of readings, because I have found a couple of other things that might be interesting. Uh, but that will be that will be coming up in the next few days. I don't think I will be doing a reading tomorrow because I have something else to do. And one day you might all know about what I've been doing, uh, but uh, that can't be today. Um, Miles says, what does the fact that some songs like Scorpion's Winds of Change garner 500 million views? Uh, I don't know. Uh, mass psychology. Uh, I, uh, it's a mystery. <laughs> I probably am not the best one to um, opine on that. Uh, but obviously, um, if I if we look at um, if we look at young people, people under twenty, let's say. Uh, their psyches are still um, not rigidly formed, I think, and there's a lot of things bouncing around in a young psyche. And so, you know, if I think back to the Beatles and how popular they were, especially among young girls in the 60s, <clears throat> and Elvis Presley, uh, too, um, you know, those, number one, it's mass psychology. Number two, it, there's a lot of instinctual stuff going on for people who are passing puberty. And, um, and people haven't yet 
sorted themselves out. And, um, and this is why I think Siddhartha is quite interesting as a book that teaches one how to sort oneself out. Um, and, uh, and Thomas says, PR, yeah, well, PR certainly helps. So it always helps to have money. Money gets more money. <laughs> Uh, okay. Well, I hope this has been useful. At this point, I've got all of this introduction onto uh, this YouTube channel. I hope that today uh, YouTube doesn't eat this video, and if it doesn't, I'll put it on playback. Uh, and uh, just for interest's sake, this symbol that's over my right shoulder uh, in this video, it uh, appears at the end of this particular part of the book right here. And um, it's used to show religious symbolism in connection with uh, Christianity. And so what Dr. Young was doing in did heavily um, in psychology and alchemy is provide a, a, a history of the human mind, um, at least the Western human mind. And uh, as probably a lot of you know, I did write a review of this book uh, some years ago. So I'm going to um, again give you the link to that. If you haven't read that review, you might find it interesting. Uh, it seems like a decade ago that I wrote it, but I actually wrote it uh, four years ago, apparently. Um, so I think that will get it on. And ah, uh, yes, happy epiphany. Uh, Thomas, let's see. Did I get there? Okay, there it is. All right, so that's my review of Psychology and Alchemy, so you can see what I thought of, of the book then and what I think of it now. And so, anyway, um, Monday we will be doing a live a feed from um, Sammy's Italian Pizza Kitchen uh, at 8 p.m., uh, and then the following Monday we'll start talking about these paragraphs. So I wanted to get the reading available to you so that you could listen to them maybe once or twice and, and we can have a further conversation about these paragraphs, these first 43 paragraphs of this book uh, at that point. So anyway, okay, so thank you for joining me today. I'm going to sign off and uh, I will see you again soon, probably over the weekend. I'll get into something. We'll see. Uh, so talk to you soon. Bye-bye.